And now it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Robin Darling Young, our speaker for this evening. She's been a visiting professor in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia, associate professor of theology at the University of Louvain, of Notre Dame, and the associate professor of theology and Greek patristics at the Catholic University, and so forth. She's been a visiting professor of Armenian studies in the University of Chicago. She's written on martyrdom in early Christianity, women and the, with the soul of Abraham, and on and on. And this evening, she's going to talk to us about something that I think we will find absolutely fascinating. She's going to talk to us about Evagrius. Evagrius the monk, Evagrius the monk and the cure of souls. We look forward to a very inviting, stimulating, thought-provoking lecture this evening. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Robin Darling Young. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'd like to add my congratulations to the recent graduates um, and say Evagrius was a deacon, so <laughs> there's a connection. I, uh, um, I, I'm honored at the presence of ecclesiastical officials, uh, seminary faculty, clergy, and all. Uh, so again, thank you for coming. I'm also honored to give a lecture named in honor of Cyril and Methodius, uh, heirs of the tradition of Byzantine learned monasticism, honored as Isa Postoli and founders of the tradition taught and nurtured um, in the seminary named after them. And I'm very grateful for your attention as I turn to a subject dear to me and one that I'm very happy to share, namely um, anything, almost anything having to do with Evagrius Ponticus, um, whom I've uh, known and uh, been very interested in for a very long time. Um, tonight, I want to take my topic, uh, take the topic uh, uh, to be the care of souls. In Greek, therapeia tes psychés, care of the soul, um, an art and a technique as old as Socrates, but taken up by later philosophers and in Christianity by philosophers who were reading the Bible and who used uh, the learning of philosophy to try and follow Jesus whose own ministry and priesthood he exercised for others and instructed his students and followers to do the same. Now I want to focus on what I think is Evagrius's response to the difficulties of the fourth century. So let me just say, um, if uh, there are people here who are not as familiar with him and as intrigued as I am, <laughs> that he was born in 345 in Pontus, the son of an olive farmer and a core bishop. Um, he was uh, ordained lector by Basil of Caesarea, so sometime uh, before Basil's death in 379. He is said to have been ordained deacon by Gregory of Nazianzus, um, so he uh, had very good company. He went to Constantinople to help Gregory there in the preparations for the Great Council of 381, uh, during which time Gregory resigned and uh, returned and left Evagrius to serve his successor, Nectarios. Uh, I'll have something to say in a minute about the influence on his life of his departure from Constantinople, but he met Melania and Rufinus when they were staying in Jerusalem, probably reaching there in 382. In 383, he went to Egypt. He spent about two years in Nitria, to the southwest of Alexandria, after which he went to the cells, or Kelia, um, 
a, a little bit farther out into the scrubland, which the monks used to like to call the desert, um, and then dying in 399. But during that period, from 382 to 399, producing an immense amount of work, um, all of which had to do in some way with asceticism and its philosophy. And yet it was an asceticism that had a very great deal to do with psychagoge, that is, the direction of the soul. Um, he developed most famously a theory of thoughts, um, reasonings is probably a better translation, the troubling reasonings which are prompted by malign forces he called demons. Um, and he did this uh, as a way of aiding others, not just monks, in order that they could regain their true selves in the path of following Jesus. And that's, of course, what I'm going to be talking about. Now, why did Evagrius turn to this particular task? Um, he wasn't the only one in the fourth century. And I think it's, uh, history always has its comforting um, moments. Uh, the fourth century was a period of great difficulty for the priesthood and for the church generally. Um, it produced many reflections on the priesthood and the care of souls. Among, um, uh, among those who were writing on the topic, of course, were Gregory Nazianzen and John Chrysostom, most famously, but also Ambrose uh, of Milan. And they were all turning to uh, this, this preoccupation, I think, because of what was the stresses and strains that the church was undergoing in the fourth century um, with a considerable amount of pressure on the Christian priesthood um, to expand its conception of itself to meet a new time period, the expansion of the church as it absorbed many, many people coming into the church thanks to um, the adoption of Christianity by Constantine, and a sense um, to which Gregory Nazianzus himself uh, um, um, it testifies that the Christian priesthood was becoming corrupt um, and becoming a place for upward mobility. So there were contending traditions within the church which also complicated the view of the Christian priesthood and the care of souls. Um, uh, Constantinus and his successors put the church under immense pressure to protect with its prayers a threatened empire. Uh, and Constantine's erection of magnificent churches in Rome, Constantinople, and Jerusalem in particular, as well as in Antioch, of course, um, led to the influx of vast amounts of money into the church. Um, and I don't need to go into the problems that that creates. Um, there were powerful patriarchates, not yet called patriarchates, uh, but uh, metropolitan bishops um, who were extending their foundations in Alexandria and the other cities I've mentioned. Um, the church was still enduring strains from a period of persecution where in various cities people had fought with each other and indeed formed separate and hostile churches, uh, particularly marked, for instance, in Carthage in um, Alexandria and it particularly in Antioch. The canon law of the church as it existed at the beginning of the fourth century was not adequate to account for this new situation. And in addition, those philosophical, by which I mean wise and uh, biblically and philosophically educated people who had been operating in city contexts, often in conversation with sages who were not Christian but were also interested in the progress of the soul, those people began to remove themselves from, the ur from urban schools and to move to deserts, uh, again, more rural places, places outside of villages, as places of exile, places of insight, 
uh, places of prophecy and removal from the urban world. Now, many of you know, of course, that much attention has been given over the course of scholarship in the 20th century to this movement uh, from the urban centers into uh, various forms of what we would later call the monastic life um, in all regions of the Christian world, first in the East and then in the West. But all of these conditions, um, I think have not, that I've just described, have not always been taken into account by scholars who have discussed um, in the famous phrase of Peter Brown, the rise and function of the holy man um, in late antiquity, uh, because the holy man, and Brown of course makes this clear, was not one who existed for his own holiness alone, or if it was a holy woman, for her own holiness alone, uh, but often removed themselves in order to concentrate more thoroughly upon the therapeia te suces, the therapy or the guidance of the soul. Um, later, of course, translated uh, famously uh, into Latin as the cura anime or animarum. Now, one of the founders, I believe, I think it's obvious, one of the founders of the monastic contribution to the care of the soul was indeed Evagrius of Pontus. And he made this contribution because of a certain disaster, I think, that occurred in his own life. And he was much sought out in his time for the insights that he had, which he indeed developed as a result of this disaster. However, we understand it if we sort of um, go underneath the hagiography that later surrounded him. Many others have discussed Evagrius's attention to the cure of the soul, or perhaps they would call it spiritual direction, anyway, sukagogia, or therapeia. Uh, for instance, the great scholars Irene Haushair, Jean Gribaumont, uh, Gabriela Bunga, still alive uh, and working in our own time, as well as the American um, monks and, and students of Evagrius, uh, Jeremy Driscoll, Luke Dysinger, and Columba Stewart, all of whose works I recommend to you very strongly and from whom I have learned. I don't think, though, that these scholars so far have tried to put together Evagrius's understanding of sukagogia, of the progress of the guidance of the soul, with his understanding of his priesthood. And so I thought it might be interesting for you today if I tried to put those two things together and say something about how Evagrius understood the monk to be a priest and offered his uh, understanding of the monastic priest indeed to priests who would consult with him and then uh, made a path for his own insight as it were to flow back into uh, the urban context of Christianity. Now there's a little problem, of course, with trying to understand Evagrius because um, the Emperor Justinian, um, trying to mediate among various parties in the mid-sixth century, understood, uh, on the advice of his lawyers, that uh, Evagrius's works, at least in their more speculative side, were heretical, and so they were destroyed in their original Greek and exist fortunately, in Syriac and Armenian translation, as well as a number of other languages. And some of his more advanced thought on what the priest is survives only in Syriac. Nonetheless, um, I think it's very important to take that work together with what we would call his more pastoral work in order to understand these two sides of, uh, of, of how Evagrius understood the priesthood to work alongside the monastic tradition of the uh, cure of souls. So Evagrius went to Constantinople to assist the admittedly temperamental Gregory of Nazianzus while the latter was at work there. The story of his fall and rise, as we might put it, is told in Palladius 
uh, later, uh, a, a person who learned a, the monastic life in Egypt as well and left a record of the life of Evagrius and other monks, which goes under the name of the Lausiac history. He tells the story of Evagrius's love affair with the wife of a, uh, of a courtier, basically, um, who uh, threatened to kill him, or so he was told by an angel. And he made a promise to the angel who visited him in a dream one night that he would uh, depart immediately from Constantinople. He was told by somebody to go and visit the Blessed Melania the Roman, as uh, Palladius calls her, who had a monastic, very learned monastic enterprise going with her good friend Rufinus on the Mount of Olives. But Palladius says that Evagrius's flight to Melania was not immediately successful. On account of his boiling youthfulness, says Palladius, and his very learned speech, he was evidently a good rhetor, and because of his large and splendid wardrobe, he would change clothes twice a day, the Coptic adds, he fell into vain habits and bodily pleasure. But God, who always keeps destruction from his people, sent a tempest of fever and chills upon him until he contracted a grave illness that persisted until his flesh became thin as a thread. Now, he became so ill that Melania extracted from him the promise that he would become a monk and go to Egypt and learn the monastic trade, so to speak, which she had herself seen on an earlier pilgrimage to that place. And so indeed he had a change of heart. He was given the monastic schema by her, which is interesting, um, and he considered her, as well as Rufinus, his, his own spiritual guide throughout his life, as well as a number of the monks that he met in Egypt. So Melania and Rufinus sent him to Nitria, where he studied among the pupils of Macarius the Great and added more recent insights, uh, re more recent than uh, Melania, Melania's, from the ascetic institutes of advanced studies, as I like to think of them, particularly the literature produced by Anthony the Great and Amonas. So to his 35 years of study, if you do the math, he spent a long time in Pontus, years lost to us because not recorded by any biographer and expunged from the record apparently, he added study with his monastic friends. In other words, he arrived in, Jerus in Constantinople and then in Jerusalem as a very learned person, steeped in philosophy and rhetoric, also of course a good theologian because he assisted Gregory and may have helped him compose the theological orations, but perhaps he didn't yet know how to apply biblical remedies to himself. And this is what he learns in Nitria. He had two years training in Nitria, as I said, southwest of Alexandria. And then when he went to the cells, he likely lived in a small cabin, uh, which in Greek is lavra and Syriac is suko. Uh, within sight but outside of the hearing range of others except for his assistant. Like others, he had to support himself and he did so by copying manuscripts. He could also, and he did also, travel to consult other monks and once to avoid ordination by Bishop Theophilus of Alexandria. He kept hours for consultation, which I think is important. Um, he practiced his ascetic regimen in the afternoon and evening and he spent his long day with very reduced sleep and food outlining in particular genres his views on this newly organizing form of life within the church. And of course he exercised vast influence on it later by his writings. In particular he wrote kephalia, short sentences which are basically like proverbs meant to be ruminated upon by uh, the people to whom he gave them 
He also wrote Scolia, Fragmentary Interpretations of Scripture, which he arranged according, again, to Sukagogia. They would lead you through uh, the biblical text by guiding your soul. He gave advice to monastic sages in the form of two writings called the Gnosticos, or the, the knowing one, the sage monk, um, and, uh, and a work which is extremely difficult and exists only in Syriac called the Kephalia Gnostica, um, which contains some of his most important thinking on the priesthood. He wrote also very long prose discourses on the foundations of the monastic life, which were introductions, and also one to his friend Eulogius, and then a, group, a corpus which is very important to me right now because I'm translating them from Syriac, which are letters giving advice, consultation, rebuke, teaching, and encouragement. He corresponded widely, still with Gregory of Nazianzus, with Rufinus, with Melania, with John of Jerusalem, with Theophilus, with the deaconess Severa, who wanted to come and see him, but he um, instead preferred to send her letters, uh, and even Theophilus, as well as others whose names are lost. He was famous for his hospitality. Uh, and again, the Coptic version of the life that Palladius writes says, he was so hospitable that his cell never lacked five or six visitors a day who had come from foreign lands to listen to his teaching, his intellect, and his ascetic practice. As a result, he had money, because in truth, large numbers of people would send it to him. You would find more than 200 coins in his possession, which he would entrust to his steward, who served in his house at all times. Um, Evagrius, in short, was still a teacher while he was in his cabin in Kelia. And he wanted to use the tradition of the teacher, which he had received, and adapt it to this new situation that I've described. Interestingly, he, his visitors were not only monks, and he wrote not only to other people whom we would now call clergy and religious, he had visit him lay people from Alexandria and even from uh, places further afield. Uh, and he, he wanted indeed, I think, to set on the right path these new institutions uh, which could assist the uh, priesthood and the high priesthood as it adjusted to its new situation. Um, so this, I think, is what is the condition that makes Evagrius turn to the matter of sukagoge, of the direction or care of souls, um, not only because he himself apparently had a crisis from which he had to right himself after he had already been ordained a deacon, uh, but also because he saw that in the situation of an increasingly wealthy church becoming increasingly a public institution, that some means, uh, a, a, a reliable path of deepening the spiritual insight of the person who really had to now learn in a new situation what it was to be a Christian was a necessary task. So when monastic communities, I think, began to gather in early 4th century Egypt, they too were confronted with a situation similar to that of, of the urban clergy. They had converts. And indeed, in this period, convert often meant someone who converted to the monastic life. They had to develop a form of catechesis to deal with the struggle of those trying to live what they thought was the full Christian life. And so naturally, they turned to the sources that they had in order to deal with these requirements. Their sources among Christians, the sources in the Christian tradition, were, as I've suggested, more appropriate to the smaller church communities which had formed in the pre-Constantinian era. 
But in Egypt, and indeed also already for Evagrius and Pontus, there were very rich traditions of guidance that were coming from Clement and Origen and could be adapted to the new situation of monastic converts and then uh, large numbers of converts um, in city churches. And I have to add here and ad lib that um, Evagrius was corresponding with John of Jerusalem, who may well have been the author of the mystagogical catechesis, it's debated, but if so, he, his work was also known to someone who was writing catechesis for, public, um, for a more public and mixed consumption, that is people uh, who were married people coming to the church and not um, only monks. So Evagrius uses the traditions coming from Clement and Origen uh, and the description of the, of the teaching of the latter, of course, famously enshrined in the Thanksgiving speech by Gregory Thal Thaumaturgus, which I have to recommend to you. Um, they had already concentrated on the importance of the disposition of students and how teachers had to very carefully attend to their disposition. So not just throw words at them, but really understand what they were and who they were as human beings and how, indeed, their parts could be uh, distinguished in order to be harmonized. Um, and this disposition, of course, would lead to an attempt to follow the commandments of Christ, which is, after all, what the monastic life is also all about, um, and participate in Eucharistic communion. Um, the, so Evagrius could turn to these earlier works, but he also had a library of works which he very likely learned in Cappadocia and Pontus, and these were works which came from the philosophical treatises of Stoics and uh, later uh, Neoplatonists, and indeed, although nobody was willing to admit it in the fourth century, Aristotelian works. Um, and like Gregory of Nyssa, he certainly applied the insights of Aristotle to the faculties and capabilities of the person. It's interesting when you read a newly edited and published work called The Disciples of Evagrius that um, those disciples record him, much as, much as Luther's disciples recorded him in the table talk, um, they record his sayings. And there are two uh, that I uh, want to read to you because uh, they, t they tell you his attitude toward this vast literature which had already accumulated outside the Christian tradition but which was becoming useful to the Christian tradition in its new situation. So Evagrius says, according to his students, if one of the outsiders should speak a true word, do not be astonished. The outsiders are, are pagans, of course. For it comes either from the natural seeds of reason or from hearing the holy ones, that would be the monks, or he says, possibly from listening to a demon. Now, uh, that's not so bad because demons actually could observe human beings. Um, and he says, for the latter often hear the holy ones teaching practical contemplation to those with them. In other words, the demons can hear the sort of elementary instruction that monks give. He says in another Kefalon in that same work recorded by students, he says, those on the outside, again, pagans, have selected justice, the kaiosune, as embracing all the virtues because it is the disposition to distribute proportionally, teaching what is more expedient, for it strips off sins according to action which the law prescribes as well. I hope you can hear Aristotelians and Stoics here. According to the teaching of Christ, though, love is the all-embracing virtue, for it also purifies the inward human, cutting off sins according to thought. <coughs> so I think this pair of Kephaliah in this interesting newly published work illustrates well Evagrius' mode of teaching. Uh, he reveals a, a truth to a group of students and he also points backwards without really naming them to his own teachers who are 
we might say um, in Dante's terms, the righteous pagans, um, who, um, whose contributions have to be tempered with the law of Christ. Well, Evagrius puts their, all, the teachings of all of them into practice in two basic ways. One, in describing a graduated pedagogy. If anyone is familiar with Evagrius, they're familiar with the trilogy of the Practicos, the Gnosticos, and the Cephalionostica, the ascending pedagogy of uh, what a later, uh, perhaps Western tradition would call uh, purgation and illumination. Um, but uh, Evagrius also um, wants to teach through the scolia that I've described elaborating how the true doctrine of the soul is, and the, the person is also, and really even um, uh, in a much better way, found in scripture properly understood. So to scripture, he applies the interpretive tradition that he had already inherited, certainly from uh, Clement and Origen, definitely from Basil and from Gregory, and again uh, circling back to Egypt from the monks who were the heirs of Origen and Clement. And he understands the person then as one who is headed toward knowledge. But this knowledge is knowledge as reception of God. So it's a, it's a different kind of knowledge from what we might mean by it. And it's founded upon a word which has given trouble to many of Evagrius' interpreters in the modern period, namely apatheia, which is translated often as, a pa as passionlessness, um, which be, sort of sounds like a zombie, actually, when you think about it, but which should be better translated as calm or repose or even contentment. And so the goal of the practicos, that is the book which encompasses the practical teaching based on philosophical psychagogy and the commandments of Christ, he founds upon commandments and virtues and aims toward apathia or calm. Love, that is what Christ recommended, can come only after apathia is uh, is established in the self. But how is apathia or calm established in the self? Well, that's by the hard work, which Evagrius sometimes characterizes as warfare, sometimes characterizes as exile, sometimes characterizes as the acquisition of the virtues, but it involves a very careful attention to the movements of the thoughts and what we would call moods. He would call them passions. So what he wanted to do, of course, borrowing later language again, is to render catechesis internal to the person. And he understood then the person in certainly classical philosophical terms, but terms which are now well uh, embedded in the Christian tradition, he understood the person as being a soul in a body. It's true. Um, not, I think, in a kind of Cartesian way and in a, in a sort of uh, ghostly haunting of a physical frame, but a body and soul which need to be uh, acting in harmony with each other. This soul has three parts, so to speak, although parts doesn't really do it justice, but, but since, since Evagrius needs to separate them for the purpose of analysis, I think it's fair enough to call them parts. And the parts are the, uh, the parts which you could summarize as concubisable or lusting, parts which are desirous have to do with eating, sex, drinking, etc., and the parts which are angry. And a more technical term for them is irascible. And these can move the soul one way or the other, toward harmony or toward disharmony. 
They're proper, if properly organized, they move the soul in the direction of a clear mind. And that clear mind is founded upon love. Now, lest this sound perhaps too platonic, I'm going to read you a scolion on Psalm 126, which treats Christ as the master of the spiritual life. And he quotes, Unless the Lord build the house, in vain do they labor who build it. Unless the Lord keeps watch over the city, in vain do the watchers keep vigil. And on this he comments, Insofar as the soul may be compared to a house, it possesses Christ within as housemaster. If it then becomes a city, it possesses Christ within enthroned as king. And if it then becomes a temple, it possesses Christ within as the existing God. For it is through the practice, that basically practice of the virtues, it acquires him as a housemaster. Through contemplation of the world as a king, and finally through theology or contemplation of God in himself as God. And the third necessarily requires the first two just as the second requires the first. But the first does not necessarily result in the second and the third. Okay, Evagrius likes numbers, but if you follow that, what he means is that you might not be successful in building up the virtues and rightly organizing your passions um, by keeping demonically inspired reasonings away. But if you follow the path closely, ask for help, and have a good spiritual guide, then it's very possible that you will. Now, Evagrius, as I've said, was analytical. And from Aristotle, he got his liking for knowing, as he says, the definitions of things. He liked definitions very much. Especially, he says, in the book The Gnostica, 17 through 19, especially those of the virtues and vices. So it is necessary to know the definitions of things, especially those of the virtues and vices. This indeed is the source and beginning of knowledge and ignorance, the kingdom of heaven and of torment. Well, that's very interesting because the kingdom of heaven, he says, is the knowledge of God. Um, well, it's actually the knowledge of God's world, to be quite precise. The kingdom of torment is not knowing. It's, it's being disharmon in a state of disharmony, fragmented, tormented by random thinking, by uh, what uh, he would in some places call demonic attacks. What is it good? Why do you need to know the definitions of things? So you can make a diagnosis. And here, Evagrius draws not only on Aristotle and Plato, but he draws on Galen and the tradition uh, of medicine in the ancient Greek world stretching back to Hippocrates. Um, he was called. Uh, by a later author, Neumatophoros kai diakritikos, that is, a spirit bearer and someone who could make a good diagnosis. Um, and uh, we have many examples, uh, particularly in his wonderful book, Thoughts. We have many examples of him making diagnosis which require very careful attention to the soul. He says, uh, and, and some of these are actually funny, so I'll read you one that's pretty funny. He says, whenever the anchorite's mind attains some small degree of calm, it then buys the horse of vainglory and immediately rushes to the cities, getting its fill of the lavish praise accorded to its reputation. We think that Evagrius must have had trouble with his own, uh, with his own sense of skill because he often talks about problems of vainglory. Um, 
What you're supposed to do is pay careful attention to yourself, not of course in a narcissistic way, but as a diagnostician with the equipment of the Bible and of the pedagogy, the psychagogy that he teaches. So he says, staying in one place, let us give more attention to ourselves so that on the one hand, we may make progress, prokope, in virtue and become less susceptible to evil. And on the other hand, renewing ourselves in knowledge, we may receive a multitude of varied contemplations and raising ourselves once again to the heights of prayer, we may m behold more clearly the light of our Savior. Sometimes Evagrius has been criticized as not being Christian enough, but actually talks about Christ a lot. Um, and indeed, Christ is really the foundation of the ability not only to love others, but also to see the world as it really is. That is, the world as God created it, and not as we with our avarice and gluttony and all the other um, thoughts that the passions disordered can promote in us tend to see it. Now, he also is careful to say that these passions or moods are not all bad. Now, so again, if you've heard that he's dualistic, that's not quite true. The angry parts of us and the lusting parts of us are ambivalent. They're not useless in this life, he says. And again, in this wonderful book, The Thoughts, he says, they're rather like sheep that we have to shepherd. And he calls up images of David and Christ as you kind of handle your own thoughts. He says, the moods that you have, anger and um, desire, are not bad in themselves, it's when they turn bad that they become like wolves and lions and bears and attack your thoughts and your person itself. He says, it's necessary to keep watch for these things, that is the uh, thoughts like animals, not only during the day, but one must also be on guard while keeping vigil at night. For you, if you entertain shameful and wicked fantasies, you might lose what is truly yours. So in other words, you would lose not only your thoughts, but also those helpful, forceful attributes of yourself that are sometimes experienced as anger and lust, but can also be experienced as determination and love. Finally, uh, I think that this psychagogy is really connected to the human community. And I want to emphasize that because, again, if you read Evagrius, you can think of him as we tend to think of the desert monastics as sitting alone in his own little hut, writing out schematized uh, pieces of advice. Um, he says we should consider how the physician of souls, he atros teisukais, that's Christ, <laughs> heals the angry part through almsgiving, purifies the mind through prayer, and in turn withers the desirous part through fasting. In this way, a new self is formed, renewed, quote, according to the image of its creator, on, unquote, in whom, on account of holy calm, apathia again, there is no male and female, in whom, on account of the one faith and love, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian nor Scythian, slave nor freedman, but Christ is all in all. You see there how he's combined Colossians and Galatians very cleverly. Now, Evagrius also talks about um, the problems that a monk might have if he does not properly found himself as a priest. So he does understand the monk as a priest, but there are dangers along the way. And uh, one of the, one of the um, most, uh, most striking images of this is in the Practicos, that elementary book, 
where he talks about vainglory, the worst of the sins. He says, the thought of vainglory is a most subtle one and readily insinuates itself within the virtuous person with the intention of publishing his struggles and hunting after the esteem that comes from people, 1 Thessalonians 2, 6. It invents demons crying out, women being healed, and a crowd touching his garments. It even predicts to him that he will eventually attain the priesthood. It has people come to seek him at his door, and if he should be unwilling, he will be taken away in bonds. So this is all the fantasy that the monk is having. When this thought has thus lifted him aloft on empty hopes, it flies off, abandoning him to be tempted, either by the demon of pride or by that of sadness, who brings upon him further thoughts opposed to his hopes. Sometimes it delivers him over to the demon of fornication, he who a little earlier was a holy priest carried off to be made a bishop in bonds. Now, Evagoras here is not criticizing the priesthood. We do not need to see, I think, a division here between some kind of charismatic monastic authority and institutional authority of the priesthood, as uh, some scholars following Max Weber have tended to see. Um, but rather an alertness to the problems of ambition in the priesthood that were coming to be so difficult, and not only Gregory of Nazianzus, but Ambrose himself and um, Gregory of Nyssa all record this, um, were becoming so problematic in the late fourth century. <clears throat> Evagrius believes that there are priests and priests, and I think that has to be admitted, just as there are monks and monks. So there are some priests who do not and cannot understand what is really happening in the liturgy, and uh, there are others who can. And this is where his teaching on the monk as priest comes in. Now, there is a passage in his work, The Gnosticus, which shows how he believes that there is a graded order of priests as well as a graded order of monks. He says in Gnosticus 14, which is interesting, lo interestingly lost uh, for the most part in Greek but exists in Syriac, he says, to priests alone, or those who among them are more advanced, respond, if they inquire, about that which the mysteries accomplished by them symbolize, those mysteries which purify the inner man, the vessels which they receive designate the concupiscible or uh, lusting part of the soul and its reasonable part. Um, tell them about the power of each vessel among them and the ac accomplishment of their actions in view of their unique goal. That would be prayer, of course. And tell them about whom is the figure of him who accomplishes the mysteries, Christ. He's a little, uh, uh, you know, too compressed here. And who are those who, with him, repel those others who raise an obstacle to pure conduct? And tell him that among human beings, some possess memory while others do not. In other words, the monk here, or at least the accomplished monk, is supposed to tell the accomplished priest of the signification of the mysteries of the altar and how the mysteries of the altar can be assisted by angels or obstructed by demons. But what Evagrius was really interested in uh, on the topic of establishing the priesthood firmly in the practice of cultivation of the virtues, of calm, of love, and of prayer, what he was really interested in was understanding the priesthood as an inward state, an inward state which then could flow outward and assist all those 
who depended upon not only the ceremonies, but the insight of the priest. And so in his work on prayer, he has four little kephaliah, little sentences, which outline what he really thinks about the priesthood and how it cooperates and indeed is necessary for a life of prayer. So uh, please forgive me while I read these. Um, if someone should wish to prepare fragrant incense, he will combine according to the law pure frankincense, cassia, anica, and myrrh in equal amounts, Exodus 30, 34 to 5. These refer to the four primary virtues, which are, of course, prudence, continence, fortitude, and justice. For if they are fully and equally present, the mind will not be betrayed. That was number one. Number two, when the soul has been purified by a, the full complement of the virtues, it stabilizes the attitude of, of the mind and prepares it to receive the desired state. That's contemplation, either contemplation of the world or contemplation of God. Prayer, he says, is a communion of the mind with God. What sort of state does the mind need so that it can reach out to its Lord without turning back and commune with him without intermediary? Well, he's just told us in the first Kephalion. Finally, he says, if Moses, when he tried to approach the earthly burning bush, was held back until he removed the sandals from his feet, Exodus 3, 5. Now, here comes the allegorical interpretation. How can you, who wish to see and commune with the one who is beyond all representation and sense perception, not free yourself from every mental representation tied to the passions. What does that mean? That means distracting thoughts and fantasies. Fantasies such as the honor you might receive as a priest or as a high priest, or the distracting thoughts of how much money you might get um, and how many people might admire you. So I think since the monk is a person who prays, and as Evagria says elsewhere, the theologian is the person who prays, we see also that the true monk for Evagrius is a priest and one who can advise priests. And actually, I think this was a contribution that he deliberately wanted to make in his writings uh, that he undertook in his years outside Alexandria to the southwest in Kelia. He reprised this view of the priesthood in his even more advanced and mysterious work, um, which I won't tax you with very much tonight, um, but which again, because of its perceived difficulties, was destroyed in Greek in the middle of the 6th century and preserved in Syriac and also in Armenian. In this work, he wants to create an interpretation of the garments of the high priest, which can be understood as the interior state necessary for one who both celebrates the mysteries and undertakes the guidance of souls. Um, and the interesting thing about this work is that he even seems to have arranged the numbers of the little kephaliah in it to accord with two seasons of the church, namely Lent and Pentecost, 40 uh, because each grouping of these six groups of kephaliah adds up to 90, even though uh, they're often thought of as centuries or hundreds. They each up add up to 90, 40 for Lent and 50 for Pentecost. So he even encodes in the numbers of his little uh, kephaliah, his proverbs, the feast of the church as it moves 
from the practice of the virtues to the celebration of insight that comes with the resurrection of Christ and the accompanying resurrection of the mind. So, for instance, he says, the intelligible robe of the priest, and this is in uh, section four of the Kephalia Gnostica, the intelligible robe of the priest is the spiritual teaching that collects those who are wandering. So it's not merely the interior state of the priest, it's also the state of the priest as the shepherd who goes looking for the lost sheep. The girdle of the priest, Exodus 28.4, sorry, of the high priest, is his humility of thumos, anger, which strengthens the mind. The intelligible mountain, Exodus 19.3, is the spiritual contemplation which is placed on a lofty height, difficult to approach. When the mind arrives there, it will become a visionary, a seer, of all the, all the, well, intellections, rational understandings of the objects that are below. In other words, again, to see the world as it really is and to value the world as it really is, as God intended it to be seen. Finally, he says, the high priest is the one who supplicates God on behalf of the entire rational nature. He separates some from wickedness and others from ignorance. The interesting thing about this, I think, is that the entire rational nature is not merely human beings, and not, I shouldn't say merely, but, and in addition, not just angels, but also those who in this time and world have become so perverse that they can be called demonic. So that in a sense, the priest exists uh, for ex Evagrius in this highly refined monastic way, which I believe also was his offering for the church as a whole. He exists to, as one who helps to gather all the fallen by his spiritual insight. Finally, Evagrius, uh, and I'll end with a... Um, chapter from his book, Reflections. Finally, Evagrius wants, I believe, to tie together the prophets and priests of the Old Testament, the priesthood of Christ in the New Testament, and the growing order of priests in his own day by his work on how to become a true priest and one who cares for souls. But he certainly thought that the place that this occurred primarily, scholar that he was, was in the mind rightly directed. And so he says, from the holy David, we have learned clearly what the place of God is. For he says, his place has been established in peace and his dwelling on Zion, Psalm 75, 3. Therefore, the place of God is the rational soul, and his dwelling is the luminous mind that has renounced worldly desires and has been taught to observe the reasons, the logoi, the rational explanations, of that which is on the earth. So the priest exists for the direction of souls oriented toward holy Zion, in order to observe and to cure. Thank you very much. And I am very, very happy to um, discuss anything you would like to discuss. Um, you may have thought, and you would have been right, that I had to leave out a section that I put in about all the other people who were writing on this subject at the same time, but maybe that will be for another occasion in writing. Um, so, um, so if you have any questions or objections or uh, queries or 
uh, or you think that Evagrius is uh, pretty strange after all, um, <laughs> please, um, please talk. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Thank you for your lecture. Oh, you're very, you're very welcome. <laughs> uh, Justin, Origen, Clemen are some of the earliest to write about theosis. And a major part of that is what Evagrius is writing about, apatheia, illumination, the virtues. Does Evagrius specifically anywhere speak about theosis, or could we argue that theosis is certainly implied in his work? I think it's implied, yes. Um, he, he prefers to speak about theologia, actually, uh, or uh, theoria theologicae, um, the contemplation that is the contemplation of God as God is. Um, but to do that, a person obviously has to be fitted for that experience. And that means the rid not only the ordering of the soul and the mind that I've been talking about here and the preparation of the, of the, uh, of the priest to assist in that, but also um, it, it really means that the mind itself has to become still and basically to receive God. So that the mind is basically, for Evagrius, the mind in its true self is a mirror for God. Uh, and that, that, I think, for him would be the, the equivalent of theosis because, uh, I mean, he's a student of Gregory here. You can, you, you can analyze things, you can analyze human beings. You can observe and catalog things in the world, like he likes to talk about birds, for instance, um, and natural, you know, critters. Um, but God, no. Uh, there's no analyzing, encompassing, describing. So the mind simply receives God. And that is, that for, I think for Evagrius would be a state of theosis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, just a question. I'm not sure if I'll pronounce the word right. Did Evagrius write much about, is it the word legoismoi? These kind of, could you talk about that and maybe other influences about that? Because that would relate a little bit to this cure, uh, care of souls. Please. Right. Um, well, Yes, he, he, of course, the Practicos is the best place to look for this, and there's a nice new translation uh, by Robert Sienkiewicz, um, Oxford Press, which is pretty expensive, so actually you can order the Cistercian Press uh, copy, which is still in print if you want to. Um, I, okay, he called those uh, logius moss, which is, is so, sometimes been translated as thoughts, but it's better translated, I think, as reasonings. And I follow Kevin Corrigan in this, um, because a thought could be sort of a one-off, you know, but a reasoning is something that is long and involved, and it's a chain of bad ideas, you know, often leading to fantasies or actions. Um, and so he arranged them in eight, according to the eight vices that he identified in the Practicos, um, and that ultimately become the seven deadly sins in the Western tradition. But he didn't mean he didn't mean seven deadly sins exactly. He meant states of the mind where you get distracted and you start running down the path of thinking, you know, the sun is over there and it's time to go to the refrigerator <laughs> um, or whatever. So um, so he. Um, so he, uh, um, but he was particularly, I think, drawn to write about this a lot because, after all, the people with whom he was dealing were not involved in day-to-day -day commerce where, um, where or they generally weren't, uh, where, um, where you sort of expect to be distracted. And, in fact, being distracted might be a good thing because you can, uh, you know, multitask. Um, uh, so really, uh, um, some of his writing is specifically for people who are trying to um, renew themselves, make themselves new, and the first obstacle they would meet 
if they're removed from human business, removed from the city, removed from their family, would be that their mind starts to wander. And you could also call them um, tempting thoughts or tormenting thoughts. It really, it really depends on the state of the person. When I, I talked to Father Dysinger about that, he called them idiot thoughts. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, well, he, yeah, he, he has a good, um, he, he has a, you know, he has a very good sense of that. Yeah, they, they, they're idiot thoughts in the sense that they make you, they don't make you smarter, they make you stupider. <laughs> um, they, they dissipate the mind when what, what, really what he wants you to be doing is collecting the mind and rendering it stable. Is there an a connection with Evagris's spiritual psychology with modern methods of what they call cognitive restructuring, restructuring where they label thoughts and things of like distortive thinking, generalizing or over -gener um, um, tyranny of should. There's a whole modern psychology thing that therapists use where they, where they help people realize how they jump to conclusions or when people say stuff, which gets them heading in the wrong direction in their understanding of how to work with people. Right. It's a type of analyzing your thoughts to have better practical um, uh, relationships and maybe more balanced thoughts. But, that's, but it doesn't, they don't read, the people that do that type of thinking usually aren't reading Evagrius's spiritual psychology. Sadly, and, no. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if, if there is an overlap and, you know. Well, the problem is a human problem, right? <laughs> um, Evagrius has taught, uh, uh, this part of us has not changed too much since the time that Evagrius wrote. So, so there's a human problem and we're equipped for this to have a lot of different thoughts at the same time. Um, and also to have ingrained reactions, which is what I think you're talking about, right? That's habits of thought that build up, uh, habits of thinking and reaction that build up over a long period of time. And actually, he does, you know, he talks about this without having the same kind of diagnosis and cure that you're talking about, I think. So, you know, there's one letter where he talks about um, how people are still reacting to their families when they're in the monastery. Yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> um, and, um, and he advises, you know, he advises, well, obviously advises fasting and reduction of food. That's part of the kind of ancient dietary techniques for getting the self in control. But he also, um, he also advises forgetting certain things, you know, trying to withdraw. So I think that would go along with cognitive therapy. I think most people who read Evagrius think that he's, his, his, um, the way he structures his thought is, might be closer to, I'm a little wary of saying this, but because this relates to what Hans Urs von Balthasar said about him, but it's a little bit closer to Buddhist uh, attempts to change thinking. So sometimes some of the proverbs that you read in him, you might al also be able to read in the Dhammapada. You know, it's a it's observation of how the human brain works. But um, but I think that his object. Well, his, his view is that the goal for every Christian, whether they attain it or not, is to become a mind that reflects God. That's really happiness, you know. And I don't think that the kind of cognitive therapy that you're talking about probably has that goal. I mean, your goal could be added to it, right, maybe, but that's not its immediate goal. Its immediate goal is to help people in the relationships that they have getting away from thinking, oh, that's, isn't that my mother, you know, isn't that, as a, <laughs> isn't that how she behaves, you know, uh, as a mother, I know that's what they're thinking about me. <laughs> um, so, so actually, actually, there's a really good book, I think it's a very good book by a psychiatrist who's also a Buddhist, which is called Thoughts Without a Thinker. And that, I think, is, uh, it, it sort of tends in the direction of cognitive therapy and also is sort of fitted to this model, or at least a Christian 
gold could be added to it. I think that was a very long and rambling answer, but I'm very interested in the topic, and that's why I rambled. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Darling Young. Robin, you are a teacher. I don't know anybody in this room who is not hungry to get back to or to discover the first time to read Evagrius. Whether we're talking about the eight vices, whether we're talking about the nice translation of the apatheia, calling it a calmness, as opposed to the passionlessness that we often see and don't really understand. The whole tour de force all through Egypt, everything that you spoke about really allowed us, I think, to be wet once again in our appetites for reading, for discussing, for reflecting, and for praying. For praying once again in the way that you have invited us. I hope that our discussion can continue over the reception and allow people to share their thoughts with you, with each other, and to continue to grow as our hope has been in this lecture series.